Dave, thank you very much for having a chat with me today. No worries. It's nearly 20 years to the date when you did something extremely brave and amazing. You scored a half an hour window when President George W. Bush was on the TV addressing <laughs> Australia. Um, you were up on the Opera House painting in bright red colours the words, no war, March 18, 2003, was it? That's right. Mr. Bush was addressing the world, giving Saddam Hussein 48 hours to leave Iraq or face military conflict. Can you take me back to that moment when you were up there on the Opera House? Describe your thoughts and emotions to me. It was a long build-up. Uh, we knew that war was in, imminent. Uh, and we'd planned the action uh, sort of organically for a few weeks. Uh, and at some point we decided we were actually going to convert a idea for a protest into a reality. Um, the emotion had bubbled across a, a whole weekend as uh, we were sort of tying up some loose ends with uh, good shoes and safety gear. Um, there was a bit of rain on the Monday, but that Tuesday morning uh, was one of those beautiful Sydney mornings. <laughs> Sun shining, sky yeah. blue. <laughs> uh, I woke up at dawn, uh, gritted my teeth and realised we were on. Um, we met, we went into Central with, with our tins of paint. Uh, we met a, a lawyer and a good friend at Central Station for a coffee. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, and jumped on the train for the Opera House. So my emotions as we did that walk from Circular Quay Station uh, to the Opera House, essentially disguised as a couple of backpackers, uh, were feelings of fear at the decline. At, at, wasn't straightforward, uh, but I also thought about why we were doing it. Um, so was there, there was, a point you wanted to back out? Were you thinking, uh oh, uh oh, maybe, maybe? I wanted to back out all the time, uh, <laughs> but I knew we weren't. Uh, and the building just got bigger and bigger, and um, I'd satisfied myself with how I was going to do the climb. There was. I'd, I'd had a couple of sandwiches there for lunch a few days before and looked at almost every tile we were going to go across and where, where trouble might lie. And trouble was at the point I thought it would be where the, the building sort of cambered off as well as headed up and got through that. Um, Do you think because you had your partner in crime, Will, that that also helped you not back out? Because there was this camaraderie of like, well, I'm not going to let him down. He's not going to let me down. Was there one of you that was a bit, <laughs> a, a bit more leading or were you both equally afraid and equally, yeah, describe the relationship? I don't know. Will, it's funny when the police in the station asked whose idea it was, we both <laughs> pointed at each other. Um, and at, at some point, I felt Will was really pushing to do it. Um, he initially wanted to paint a wall in Newtown. He just said, I've got this tin of paint, we should do an anti-war message. And I said, mate, like everyone paints a wall in Newtown. You, you, let's think bigger, let's think somewhere where there's a bit of an impact at least. And he said, where would that be? And I, I said, well, if you want to start at the top echelon it's the top of the sales of the Sydney Opera House and at that point I was not talking at all seriously yeah. <laughs> but I was trying to take him out of a back lane in Newtown yeah uh, where everyone would say so what um, but I instantly saw his uh, very scientific brain taking that very seriously and at that point I sort of went oh my god he's now <laughs> thinking of this and it, it was really a case of him processing the possibility of being deported as a, a British national and, and the ramifications but he, he really 
kept his eyes on that target. As, so he was engineering it. You kind of spurted out this idea, and then did he engineer like the execution? Oh, or? we both did. You both did. Um, okay. I, I was living remotely, so I, I was I was hardly ever in Sydney uh, except for odd bits of work, uh, and yeah, he he had the paint he started testing it out on different surfaces and different types of paint <laughs> on tiled surfaces uh but how did you know it's it's enormous actually you know how how many meters big was it the, the letters we found that out in court the police said it was 25 <laughs> by five so it's enormous how did you know that your letters weren't going to be wonky or was that just Oh, I'd had a bit of a scope out of okay. the corporate logos on the other skyscrapers ah, around, and I, I worked so... out pretty much what we needed to be painting to. Because there's no time to stencil it in. You just up no, <laughs> no, and and the other aspect of it was writing writing it upside down. So, but we we didn't practice that too much, except with textures on a bit of paper and just made sure you I mean it'd be embarrassing to do that and get the spelling wrong you'd, you'd look very stupid get the n backwards the yeah. n would have been the most difficult <laughs> so yeah falling off and getting the spelling right was was wow. two important things and so when you were actually up there was it that much adrenaline going through your body that there wasn't really emotion because surely you were just trying to focus on the task a little bit. Um, Will was doing the painting. I was making sure at the he was at the end of a five metre long roller pole, and so I had to steer the the roller into the tray and make sure the paint was being poured into the tray to keep him going. Uh, and the other task I assigned myself was putting padlock and chain on each of the three trap doors on the spine of the opera house so they couldn't get out. Um, I'd also left my phone number down the bottom to be handed to the police. So oh. they, there, there was a huge paranoia around terror attacks then and I just wanted them and us to have really good communication from the second they arrived. Right. Uh, so it's the like, cops. We are peaceful protesters. <laughs> it was pretty funny. They rang up and and you know this is Inspector so and so. Um, I said, oh, this is Dave. And he he said, why did you leave me your number? And I I, I said, I just want to assure you everything's going to be cool when you get to us. We're not going to do any harm. We're just going to paint this message and and that'll be it. So and he let you finish. No, they were they were locked out, and that conversation. He said, "We could, don't seem to be able to get back out." And I said, oh, "I don't know." And um, I said, "But we'll just keep painting till you you get here." And he said, "Well, don't come down." I said, "No, we'll keep painting." Um, but uh, he said, "Why did you leave me your number?" And I, you know, I said, "It's a non-violent action." And he said, "Well, you you're peace protesters, aren't you?" And and from that moment, I felt like pretty good that we had that kind of police officer yep. turn up and it was all going to be calm. Um, uh, yeah, there wasn't much time to look around and appreciate where you were um, until we were uh, apprehended when the, I, you know, the, the paint job was eventually good enough that I said to Will, I'm going to go down and unlock. So to get up on the roof, there's little trap doors you're saying? There are their little sliding hatchways. And how did you figure out that where they were? I knew, I had a, tried to have a look. Um, That's amazing. Prior to going up, but both from photos and the naked eye, but couldn't really see much because of the contrast of the white and the, mm. the shadow. It was hard to see what we were dealing with, but I knew there'd be uh, internal access to the roof, which is where any police would come to stop an action on the roof. So just to buy us the time to make the message look good. And the Opera House was functioning that day, so you just got to walk in or you actually had to break in? We, we climbed from outside. It was an outside climb. Okay, because I'm imagining a trapdoor from internally. 
Okay. That's how we got down. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so it was an outside rig. So we free climbed the tiles oh. and went up the spine. Um, oh. Probably on the route chosen by every drunk at the Crowded House concert or yeah. other. We, we later found out that security had a bit of trauma from some accidents that oh. have occurred there with drunk people. So it, it, it was the easiest route. Um, and yeah, we, we did it. We purposefully chose 8.30 a.m. on a weekday morning as... Well, also when Bush was on the television. Too. We didn't choose that. That was a complete fluke. What? Um, and we only found out when... Uh, in the interrogation, the police asked us how we knew the war was going to be announced. And oh my we goodness. sort of looked at each other where we didn't. Um, wow. So it sort of, there was a bit of drama there with the police thinking we somehow had access to intelligence and the opera <laughs> and the opera house thought we had inside help. In, in, yes, yeah, so it's a whole other layer of investigation going yeah, on. Yeah, and, wow. and really it was a couple of hippies striking lucky with the timing which could have been the day before if it hadn't rained or the week before if i'd been happy with the footwear i'd had wow that's incredible so, yeah. so you were arrested and sent to prison for nine months and there was a hefty cleaning fee of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars but now the photograph is due to hang in the australian war memorial can you tell me how does it feel to have good recognition after all these years, after 20 years? It's been a slow build that. I mean, there was an instant response of a roar of approval from, from everyone who opposed the war at the time. And, mm. and the polls were running at upwards of 70%. So it, it didn't we didn't feel alone from the start but then the the weight of an anger of of the system came pretty hard at us because there were, was moments was there where you were afraid of, for your family and things like that when you were in prison and wasn't there well, i wasn't af afraid so much in prison the prison okay. was hectic but if you pulled your head in and just you know once the doors shut there you're all in the same boat um and no one should feel any more special than anyone else. So if you took that approach, that was okay. And, you know, if you were being picked on one day, it wasn't because I was the bloke who painted the opera house. It was just my turn to be picked on that day. Um, and, and strange things happen all the time in places like that. Um, but... Uh, the fact that 20 years later, it's the paint pot, the shoes, um, and a few other knickknacks that have gone gone to the Australian War Memorial, uh, the roller as well. Um, so I, at the moment, they're placed next to the fighter jet that dropped the first bomb in Iraq. Oh. Um, so yeah it is a recognition that uh it was part of the conversation that we were having nationally back then um when the war memorial first asked to acquire the items you know my first question was how are other people going to feel about this and uh do you really want these things in the war memorial which is certainly not what i associate my visits to the war memorial as a kid with with being and and they said well actually there there are a lot of uh protesting bits and pieces and memorabilia from the vietnam war um and when it comes to a war in the middle east which was so heavily opposed by you know not just the 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 peace movement, but the the very mainstream population that the the protests against the war are a very valid part of the narrative. Um, and yeah, in, in that context, I'm very happy they're there. That's where they should be. But did it affect, like, to just roll back a bit? 
after you got out of prison? What was your life like? Did it affect your life? Was it trouble getting work? Was it... Still is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they don't ask, generally ask why when they see you've got a criminal record. Yeah. Um, I tend to tell anybody straight out now. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it was a bit annoying that of all the hours you've spent doing things. Um, I mean, I've worked in forest conservation and a few human rights issues around the place. And, you know, a lot of that works writing thousands and thousands of, of words in, in reports and letters, what have you. And it, it is a bit ironic. You, you go and write five letters somewhere and that's yeah. what everyone's going to know you about. Well, because it's amazing. It's, it's incredible. There's, I guess so, it there's was. so many elements to it. <laughs> no one's done it before. There's a lot of tact, and you, you said it was not really thought out beforehand, but it, it seems really well thought out. Yeah. It seems like a spy operation. It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. I, I guess, when going back to what you said about the a bit being focused on the task at hand and the outer body experience, was you know, not so much the physical aspects of that Sydney day but but also I, I just said to Will I want to make sure we do this right and survive the climb and no one gets hurt and the the consequences we'll have to deal with later um, so so while dealing with the consequences sometimes it was like it wasn't you that did it and you could sort of put yourself in the position of I guess the people who were angry at you as well as supportive um mm. but yeah the the fallout was uh it's, it still continues in some ways <laughs> at least there's a bit more positive um recognition happening and in terms of the sentence was there a time where they wanted to put some fear into you and say you're going away for a really long time or did you know yeah tell me about that oh they tried um and of course when sentencing comes down to a lot of considerations uh pleading guilty early uh gets you a discount we didn't we pleaded not guilty and uh stared them down uh so that was tempting something pretty bad um then your your previous convictions and good character comes into it and i knew when i handed my character references in they 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 sort of said Dave's a good guy he does lots of stuff in the community um and then Will's colleagues handed his in which said you know Will's responsible for designing the world's largest optical telescope and is worth a few hundred million to us in research and development and we would be really inconvenienced if he was in jail. So they I, I weren't think, expecting that character reference. <laughs> no, I think I'm. I think I'm grateful to Will for being who he is because I think if it was mine, we would have been in for longer. They they were certainly trying, yeah. um, and they wheeled out um, Mark Tedeschi, the infamous Crown Prosecutor. You know you're in trouble when he turns up. Uh, so for a while, yeah, it, it was the pressure was on, um, and the the judge certainly made us squirm over the the days and weeks of the various hearings that took place. Wow! And despite all this fear you would have been feeling, you know you still allowed what seemed to be some humor and some creativity come in because for the cleaning fee, you guys came up with this brilliant way to crowdfund, which was making these little snow globes with the opera house inside of them and having the words no war on there and then selling them to get the money. So, you know, your brains were still <laughs> working away being like, how can we get this money? Can you explain? A bit about that. Yeah, well, we in the lead up to the court hearing where we were going to find out what the cost of the bill was, we sort of had these various figures floating around in our head, and you know, people who knew a bit about large operations to remove paint would come up and tell us what they thought it was worth, and then the fi figure of 
166,000 finally came from the Opera House, which yeah, right. consisted of crane hire, uh, graffiti removal companies, chemicals. There were, there were four companies involved in the actual cleanup, and then there was a $20,000 report on the cleanup. Um, and, you know, once the, the magnitude of that figure hit us, we sort of were sitting outside the court and saying, well, there's all these souvenir shops with Opera House kitsch in them. Uh, why don't we paint the souvenirs and anyone who donates to the cleanup uh, can get get one as a present with a you know suggested present for a suggested donation. We couldn't sell them. Um, we were warned about That's that. That's right, suggested donation. Proceeds of crime and all that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, it was a donation, and uh, the snow globes. And you know, where could people pick them up from? Oh, they picked them up from us and at our events. Oh, and then okay. people who had various market stalls or shops would sometimes say, oh, look, I can move a few of those. I can move a few. For, for you. Donation. And uh, it went like that. It was, it was quite organic. Uh, and then we, we found the souvenir, the giant souvenir warehouse right next to Sydney Airport where all this plastic, you know, stubby holders and coffee mugs and snow globes and, and what have you come in from China and uh, we went there and had a little deal going with that warehouse as to... Uh, but was the idea, did it come to you first snow globe like specifically or was it just let's do a souvenir and then you saw the snow globe and you go this is... Yeah we, we just thought souvenirs in general okay. and, and we were doing stubby holders which were yeah. pretty popular and I think I said I'd love to figure out a way to break into a snow globe and it was Will's, Will's colleagues at the CSIRO who came up with the answer to that, good old scientist. Yeah, please explain. You said you had a fry pan. What else? What else was needed to deconstruct the snow globe? Yeah, you melted the glue so you just sat them in water in a frying pan, uh, gently pulled the glass out of the base, then you had to pull a plug out of the glass with pliers. I think we got it down to one in 10 was a breakage when we reached peak construction performance. Uh, Genius. And uh, then you'd paint, or you'd, you'd use a permanent marker to right. maintain the water upside down in the open globe. Uh, right, uh, no war on the, in tiny little permanent marker on the sails. And, um, Incredible. We had a few malfunctions where the product started to fade and a few customers complained. Um, complained? <laughs> well, we said it was like art imitates life with the, the yeah. paint was taken off, wasn't it? But uh, we fixed that with a bit of uh, clear nail polish. Oh, right. It Moved over to nail yeah. polish. Then you hair dried it and put it all back together. Wow. And then you were saying how you even went to Woodford and did cooking shows. Yeah, was that a well, part of this momentum to get the story out there and get the the fine paid off um and the cooking shows was how to cook a snow globe down <laughs> yeah we we did a few in i did a few in a few pubs around the place and then then woodford had had me as a speaker uh which was great because that that amplified our fundraising uh and yeah i was there mic'd up cooking putting snow globes together and Amazing. discussing the event or Amazing. the story of the day. Just another example of the comedy and the humour that you have brought to the situation. Yeah, it had to be, um, had to be done with a smile on your face. It, yeah. It was already a heartbreaking, serious issue. Mm. And, you know, that war has affected the world to this day. Um, and our place in it as a country exactly. still goes on. That leads to me to my next question. Can you share with me your philosophy or worldview on war? Why do you think countries think it is a, thinks it's a solution? Far out. <laughs> if, if you could answer that one, we'd... Uh, so you're, you're stumped and you just do what you can. Yeah, is that a good enough answer? It's, it's a sad answer, but... Um, 
we, we see now we're, we're in the region with a massive arms build-up. Uh, there's, there's another war in Europe uh, and humans just don't seem to seemingly take what would be a biological or evolutionary step to sort out disputes without this, this horrible aspect of our lives and, and as we're the species that have developed such hideous technology. Yeah, that's what's we, the scary part we is owe the it technology to the world to try. advancing. Yeah, sometimes I wish that the prime ministers or presidents of countries could just get together in sand pits and fight it out on behalf of their countries. They're still keeping an element of, <laughs> of, of sorting out conflict, but not dragging in all this, yeah, technologies, advancements now with AI on the scene. And it's just... It's quite overwhelming. It is. What's, what's possible. Um, and even, even the, the leaders elected or not elected who are, who are managing these and you know moving ordinary people around at, like chess pieces mm -hmm. it, it's heartbreaking um I, I was lucky enough during some of the the public speaking we were doing as a result of the action to to meet a couple of uh american they were from veterans for peace and we did a little speaking tour of europe and and australia and uh just the uh, the anger and helplessness they felt as people on the ground there and the behavior they witnessed it's gobsmacking mm. and i don't have an answer i'm sorry no it's fine and what my next question is is have you been an activist since you can remember like i know you've been involved in other things with forestries and whatever, but has it always been a pulse within you? The first time I felt the activist's urge was actually in the 80s when I was a kid and I was watching uh, people get arrested on television in places like Terrania Creek near Lismore and the Franklin and I was you know, because I'd, I'd been brought up thinking being arrested was the worst possible thing that could ever happen to you. And um, I remember specifically watching people getting arrested on television in the Franklin and my mum and dad tut tutting at them. And, and I just was in awe that someone would be prepared to be arrested for something they believed in. Um, and it was literally a trip to the southeast forests that almost happened by accident. Uh, we went down to Eden. The only reason I went was because I'd picked up a football injury and I couldn't play footy. Uh, and I saw for the first time a, an industrial logging clear fell for wood chip and I'd always grown up in the bush and knew it was outrageous and ended up staying on that black blockade for a couple of years. So, uh, that that sort of was my introduction to activism and mm. yeah, never really looked back. And you've done some things around here locally as well or in Bellingen Shire in the 90s? Yeah, there were the northeast forest campaigns of the, the early and mid 90s in, in places like Chalandi and yeah. Wild Cattle Creek uh, mm. and you know they're still going today in some cases yeah i think it's really important part of our culture protesting and australia's had a long history with protesting how does it make you feel that in 2020 parliament quickly passed laws around protesting such as introducing additional legislation now to deter such actions as lock-ons oh it's it's ridiculous that the answer to politicians from both the major parties constantly seem to think that clamping down harder and harder on, on protesters is going to solve whatever problem they think they're solving. Um, it's, it's a very strong part of our history, peaceful protest, um, and, and goes right back. And uh, generally, if, you know, there's a bit of an edgy, 
space where, where people who are passionate about an issue want to go out and do some direct action. It seems that there is a way to, to negotiate how the community feels with that, how the impacted industry feels with that, what the pro protesters are prepared to do without this clampdown, which mm. just, where does that end, mm. is, is what you ask yourself then. And it just ends in this draconian situations where, where people will keep pressing the issue harder and harder. And um, these, these sort of disproportionate outcomes in terms of people impacted by, you know, what they're prepared to do, um, what they're making, what they're using police to do. Um, funnily enough, with the gear that's just gone to the war memorial, the, after we were found guilty and fined, the police and the opera house put together a court case to apply to destroy all the gear associated with the protest to what? to wipe it out of history uh, and they were i said why are you doing this and this is because of the new laws they're passing no no nah, nah, this no. was back in the day oh, right, um, okay, yeah. not related to the protest laws oh, right. but it, it was related to the mentality of yes. it in in that they just wanted to wipe it from history and and mark tedeschi the the crown prosecutor you know, I, I was saying, why are you doing this? This is just ridiculous. And he he said, we think you might want to sell them. And um, I just shook my head. Um, and we ended up, uh, funnily enough, the padlock and chains I'd used to seal the hatchways were given back to me and not used as part of the court case, we think, because they were embarrassed that they got locked out and they just wanted to wipe that from the narrative. Uh -huh. Um, and there were a few other things we'd got back that weren't kept as evidence. Um, we actually had a little Australian flag draped over the side saying, you know, which was really a message to say this isn't just activists feel this way, it's the whole country. Um, so in, when they applied to destroy the paint pot, we brought all this stuff back and I said, well, you should destroy the padlock and chains and you should destroy this Australian flag. We fl and that sort of shut the what whole thing down. What a great argument. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, we, you know, we had letters from museums saying, you know, Ned Kelly essentially was a murderer, but you wouldn't destroy his armour or the, the memorabilia and the, the historical artefacts yeah. associated with that. Sure, we committed a crime. It seemed to be considered important narrative of, of that day and historically why you were applying to destroy it. Um, so we won that case. We, we didn't need lawyers. We did it all ourselves. Um, and we made, we said, we'll under, make an undertaking to the, the court that we won't sell it for profit if that's what the main thing you're worried about. Um, and uh, we walked out with the gear. It, it was quite funny because we, walked over to the Sydney Police Centre to get our stuff back and our arresting officer, Christine, who'd since moved to the fraud squad over the years of, of it progressing, she, we saw her standing behind the glass in the Sydney Police Centre waving the paint pot at us and doing that. So it was, a, it was a nice little way to, you know, after legal battering, after legal battering that we got, we ended it with this victory yeah. that saved the paint pot. Wow. And even, you know, 20 years ago when that happened, I still sit here thinking, wow, those repercussions were immense. But imagine what would happen now. Yeah, because well, friends are going through this, much much younger friends who are the, the next generation of activists, uh, especially The clampdown is terrifying. The clampdown is huge. Uh, and these insane police raids that seem to be targeting uh, environmental activists harder than perhaps activists in other areas. Yeah. Um, and most people aren't aware of this. People, I think the general public think that they could protest if they wanted to, but perhaps they don't because it's not, you know, you don't find out about these things unless you look. No, that's right. Uh, 
And it, it's mainly anti-coal activists who've been copying the brunt of this, mm. um, which where I'm from in the Hunter Valley is sort of the front line of that. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's it's there's a few people who sort of before the courts at the moment who are getting pretty good judgments uh, and and of course there's organisations like the Environmental Defenders Office who are attempting to challenge the laws um, but it's not a I mean politicians who are enforcing these and thinking they've solved a problem for themselves forever should actually look at why these people are out there in the first place and, and why uh, I mean, it's always a cliche to go on about generations and old, the old mm. the elders and the, the younger generations. But, yeah. I mean, if if you can't look a, a young person in the eye and claim that you're doing the best for their future with, with all that we now know about climate change and climate science yeah. and the repercussions if we don't act immediately, which in, in the case of the port of Newcastle is, is getting out of coal as soon as possible. Yeah. Do you think there's been a decline in protests in general though, aside from all these laws? Because I'm one that sort of tends to romanticise the past, even though I'm young. I feel like it was much more common for people to be intellectually aware of the social issues and perhaps more ready to engage in a protest. Whereas now, you know, I'm because my father's an activist as well, now, people in my generation, I don't know, I don't know anyone that's an activist. Have you noticed that? Uh, it's hard asking an activist that question. Yeah, because all your <laughs> friends are activists, but you're but, aware of the culture too. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not, I, I remember sitting around campfires as a teenager and we're just going, where are the other activists? Yeah, right. Um, and... Um, I see a lot of activism now. So, I mean, it's different circumstances, different technology. Um, I think there's a lot more engaged people than than there were. Um, the, the the access to information and the ability to do something about it is now in the home, whereas we had to meet people or something on television would have to push us into a space. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because I feel that that information is actually a double-edged sword now that you're spinning a positive on it because to me it feels like there's a desensitisation happening. Yeah. There's so many issues that it actually feels watered down because everywhere is chaos and you don't know what to focus on. Or where to start or and it feels less at stake even though there's so much more chaos in fed to us yeah. that's kind of the feeling that i'm getting but you're yeah. saying that it's even easier to access the information and to make a change which i like <laughs> oh yeah well i'm yeah it, it is i mean there's just it's just what we've it's the playing field we're in mm. um whether that leads to better outcomes or increased numbers there's, there's probably some PhD student out there who might be able to tell us, but I'm not that. Um, yeah, there's there's pe more people liking cat videos than out in the forest, but uh, <laughs> there you go. What do you think the That's future right. of protesting should, should be then? Where can we go from here despite these rules and laws coming in? It's... It's, there's no one simple answer. I mean, I've always felt that the environment movement or any movement is always healthy when people are in there fighting like mad at all levels. So in the, the political level, the legal, the front line, and, and are all on the same page as to what we're trying to achieve. Um, I'm not so sure what these generic sort of protests like Extinction Rebellion or Occupy or sort of saying we are mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore without a real focus. I'm not 
real sure what they're going to achieve. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need specific goals and targets, even though they might just be addressing one problem and not a whole host of others. Um, but when you look around and see what people are doing on, on issues that you never knew about even, uh, it's, I'm encouraged. Mm. Maybe I just look in the right spots on the internet, I don't know. Mm. I'd love to see some sort of app, maybe there already is one, but an app that's just purely about protests and you can see which ones are on, which ones are happening. You can see if there's in your local area. You can go to evenings to talk about it. I mean, Bellingen's actually quite good. There's the Bellingen Activist Network and they get together every Wednesday. And I that's amazing for a small town. It's incredible. But imagine having something broader than that. It's not Facebook because, you know, Facebook's yeah. getting used, but we don't need Facebook. That's part of the problem. We need something outside of it. That's, yeah. I'd love to see Social that. interaction's always best. Yes, uh, of course. But there's pros and cons to... I mean, you, you're now able to find out what's happening in Iceland or Denmark instantly, whereas before that was just a... You know, you'd meet someone telling you or pick up a newspaper with a little article about activism and, and what was happening in other parts of the world and how people were going about it. It was, it was a difficult thing to organise... Yeah. prior to this instant sort of communication society we've we've now got uh yeah it's uh it's a team effort that's gonna get us through the the problems the world's facing and yeah not lose hope yeah <laughs> not, not just a bunch of activists not just a yeah all of us together yeah. caring igniting that yeah and we can't afford to go to war again no not now no thank you so much for your time dave it's been amazing to dive into your world <laughs> <laughs> thank you Cheers.